Hello, uh, my name is Dmitry Tikhonov, uh, and the topic of today's presentation is programming LS Quick. LS Quick stands for Lightspeed Quick. Quick LS Quick is an open source Quick library, and Quick is a new general purpose transport protocol for the internet. Uh, right now, it's at its final standardization stages at the IETF. The goal of my presentation is to show how to use LS Quick. There is also an accompanying tutorial program on GitHub that uses LS Quick. Presentation outline. The presentation will proceed as follows. After the introduction, I'll describe LS Quick history, features, and architecture. The bulk of the time we'll spend presenting and discussing LS Quick API. Please do not hesitate to ask questions as we progress through the slides. If time permits, there will be a bonus section. Example program, toot.c. Uh, you can follow along with the presentation. Uh, snippets of this tutorial program are used as the examples in the following slides. Now, we're about 10 minutes away uh, from the time that we'll really delve into the APIs, so it gives you enough time to clone this repository and build it. Uh, it pulls in boring SSL, which takes a couple of minutes to compile, depending on your hardware, uh, but 10 minutes should be plenty of time. Now, I promise the organizers not to talk about quick too much, but I'm going to do it in 60 seconds, just a short background. Uh, now, the reason Google started working on quick in 2012 is ossification. Ossification is what uh, is the strange things that uh, happen to packets as they traverse middle boxes. Ossification prevents new internet protocols from being deployed successfully. Quick began as HTTP2 over UDP. Now Quick is an actively developed set of IETF standards. It is a general purpose transport protocol. Quick's killer feature is HTTP3. HTTP3 RFC is scheduled to be released together with the Quick RFC later this year. Other application protocols using Quick have been proposed. NetConf over Quick, DNS over Quick, anything else you can, you can name over Quick. The momentum behind Quick is strong and its future is bright. Some people say that Quick is the future. Now we must uh, touch upon the terminology used when we talk about Quick. In the beginning, Quick stood for Quick UDP Internet Connections, and it was Google's implementation of HTTP2 over UDP. When IETF started standardizing Quick, the protocol was split into two parts, the transport part, Quick, and the application part, HTTP. Uh, the slides that will follow when we say talk about Quick will mean IETF Quick. Also, quick is no longer an abbreviation. We're just supposed to shout it. Introducing LS Quick. LS Quick began as a proprietary uh, component, and then we open sourced it. It is written in vanilla C. It has minimal dependencies. Uh, our main emphasis on the performance uses as little memory and as few CPU cycles as possible. Uh, our next goal is uh, flexibility. We can, LS Quick can be uh, configured to perform a variety of tasks in different ways. And uh, last but not least is portability. I know this is Linux conference, uh, but uh, LS Quick also runs on other platforms, FreeBSD, macOS, Windows, Android, and uh, even Raspberry Pi. LS Quick history. In 2016, we set a goal to add support for the Google Quick protocol to our web server, Lightspeed web server. And in 2017, we shipped support for uh, Google Quick version Q035 and open sourced Quick, LS Quick on GitHub. We open sourced only the client bits of the library because we wanted to keep the server parts to ourselves for competitive advantage over other web server vendors. IETF began working on Quick in 2018 and at IETF 103 in November 2018, LS Quick became, became the first functional HTTP3 web server when the Facebook client interrupted with it. In 2019, we released LS Quick 2.0 to GitHub, and this part, with this time, we open sourced both the server and the client components. And in the summer of that year, we shipped HTTP3 support. And this year, uh, by the end of this year, we hope to see RFCs for both Quick and HTTP3. Uh, features. Now, among about a dozen or so extant Quick implementations, LS Quick is one of the more featureful. 
it supports almost all of the things that the quick uh, transport and HTTP drafts uh, recommend. Uh, we support ECN, which stands for ex um, explicit congestion notifications. We support spin bits, which allows network observer to calculate RTT of a quick connection. Uh, we support path migration and NAT rebinding. Uh, we support DPLP MTUD, uh, push promises, which is an HTTP3 feature. Uh, we support TLS key updates and several experimental extensions, such as the Lossbit extension. Lossbit extension allows network observer to locate uh, the source of a packet loss on a quick connection. We support timestamps extension, which allows one to calculate one-way delay, an important part of some congestion controllers. Uh, we support delayed DAX extension, which uh, allows the connection to fine tune the number of acts issued and therefore minimize the number of packets sent, which improves uh, performance. And we support the quick grease bit extension, which uh, randomizes the value of a particular bit in the header file to reduce acidification opportunities. Uh, we support Google Quick versions 43, 46, and 50. Uh, Q050 is what Chrome uses right now. And uh, we support the latest ITF drafts, 27, 28, and 29. And also LSFIC possesses many, many uh, configuration knobs. LSQIC architecture. The LSQIC library does not use sockets to receive and send packets. All that is performed using callbacks. The library also does not mandate the use of any particular event loop. Instead, it has functions to help the user schedule events. Thus, using an event loop is not even strictly necessary. The various callbacks and settings are supplied to the engine constructor. LSQIC uh, keeps uh, quick connections in several data structures in order to process them efficiently. Among others, connections are kept in two priority queues. One priority queue holds connections that are ready to be processed in the order of uh, connections, and the other calls them uh, based on the next uh, timer expiration value. As a result, connections are processed uh, very efficiently. Objects. LSQIC exposes three basic object types to the user, engine, connection, and stream. An engine manages connections, processes incoming packets, and schedules outgoing packets. It can be instantiated either in server or client mode. If your program needs to have both quick client and quick server functionality, you can instantiate two engines or as many as you want. This is what we do in our Elite Speed Web ADC product, which acts both as the server and the client. In addition, uh, LSQIC engine can be instantiated in HTTP mode. A connection carries one or more streams, ensures reliable data delivery, and handles the protocol details. In client mode, a connection is created using a function call. In server mode, a connection, by the time the user gets uh, a connection, uh, the handshake has already been completed. That is not the case in client mode. Uh, streams do not exist by themselves. They're always part of a connection. Streams are bidirectional and usually correspond to request uh, response exchange depending on the application protocol. Application data is carried using streams. The HTTP mode. HTTP support is included directly into LSQIC. The library hides the interaction between HTTP application protocol and the quick transfer protocol, such as control streams, data framing, and header compression. Uh, the user uh, gets access to the uh, HTTP protocol in unified way. By unified, I mean GQuick and HTTP3 have identical interfaces in LSQuick. Uh, the reason this is done this way is uh, that GQuick's original goal was to erase the boundary between application and transport layers to improve performance. When we started work on support for HTTP3, we kept the same design, even though IETF has different drafts for quick and HTTP protocols and they different beasts. Um, so this is historic uh, circumstance, but it allows for some optimizations. Uh, you can write to an HTTP stream and have your data end up directly in a packet ready to be sent. On the other hand, it does include complexity, increased complexity in the library, and I don't think we'll be adding support for other application protocols directly into LSQuick. Uh, now we finally get to using LSQuick uh, to include 
the file you need the one single include file lsqdh uh, this file contains on the nest, all the necessary declarations and it pulls in auxiliary lsqdh types that age library initialization this is an example from uh, toot.c uh, before instantiating objects the library itself needs to be instantiated and depending on whether you which types of engines you're going to instantiate server or client you can pass the appropriate flag to the initialization function depending on the platform it will instantiate uh, monotonic timers and depending on some other flags it will instantiate um, server-side uh, uh, certificate cache for gquick and it will initialize the crypto library introducing the tutorial program now this time it's been a little bit over 10 minutes uh, into our presentation or our tutorial and i hope you've had time to download and compile the um, program i'm going to ask stop shortly to see if you have uh, any questions one second i'm not sure how to see it Well, uh, I'm not sure how to get to the uh, chat from my screen. So I will just move on. You can perhaps ask me uh, directly using audio. Oh, no, there is chat. Ah, there are no questions. I apologize. Um, so the program 2.c illustrates LSQuick API use. It contains both client and server code. Uh, it is a simple echo service. The client sends lines to the server and server reverses them and sends them back. Uh, each request is sent in a single bidirectional stream. And several examples that follow are taken directly from toot.c program. Running the tutorial program. Uh, it has several options. Uh, use the dash H flag. Uh, you, to run, you can run it both in client or server mode. Uh, the server takes dash C and dash K arguments to specify a certificate and the key file. And you can see a small example here on this slide. Uh, the server specifies it's going to listen port 12345 and clients connect to it and sends it a line and server sends it back. Engine constructor. LSQuick engine new is the engine constructor. It allocates, initializes, and returns a new engine object. The first argument is a bit mask to tell the engine whether or not it's in server or client mode. And the second bit specifies whether or not to turn on the HTTP functionality. The second argument is a pointer to the so-called engine API struct. This structure specifies various callbacks used by LSQuick API. It may also point to a settings struct. There are many settings. Both the API struct and the settings struct are copied into the engine. Specifying engine callbacks. Here's a minimal uh, version of the second argument to the engine constructor, the engine API struct. The user must provide a pointer to a function that the engine will call to send packets. It will pass this function user specified data, a packets out CTX. Note that incoming packets are passed to the engine using a function, which we'll cover uh, in the later slide. Uh, the second required piece of information is the pointer to connection and stream callbacks. Uh, these are functions that get called when connections and stream get created and destroyed, uh, and also functions that are called when read and write events occur. In server mode, one must also specify a function to get initialized SSL context. And here's an excerpt from uh, our tutorial program. You can see that because it runs in both client and server mode, we check for a flag. And if it's a server, we set, uh, we give it the uh, server callbacks. And for client, we specified client callbacks. Uh, we assign uh, the get SSL CTX function unconditionally. Uh, the client engine will not call this callback. Packets in. 
UDP datagrams are passed to the engine using the LSQuick engine packet in function. This is the only way to do so. A pointer to DDP payload and to its size, and its size are passed to the uh, function, as well as uh, pointers to local and peer socket addresses. Uh, another piece of information that is passed is the void peer context pointer. Uh, it, this context pointer gets passed to the functions that uh, send packets, sends packets out. In a standard setup, this uh, peer CTX pointer is usually just associated with the file descriptor, but depending on the network stack you use, it may be, it may be pointing to something else. And the ECN is a standard value as described in RFC 3168. Why specify local address? Uh, the local address is necessary because it becomes the uh, source address for outgoing packets. It is important in multi-home setups where um, destination address of a packet on a single file descriptor may be different. Also, changes in local and peer addresses are used to detect changes in paths, such as path migration during the uh, classic parking lot problem or NAT bindings. When path change is detected, Quick Connections performs several special steps to validate the new path. Uh, the packets out callback. Now, this is the function to send outgoing packets as, as uh, specified in uh, engine API struct. Uh, the packets are sent out, and this call is made when connections are being processed. This is an explicit call by the user, uh, which we'll cover in a later slide. This function is uh, passed user specified context and an array of um, packet out specifications. It returns the number of datagrams sent. Now, when an error occurs, this function returns minus one, or it returns a number that is smaller than the number of diagrams passed in. In that case, uh, the engine examines the value of Erno, and there are two main Ernos that we need to concern ourselves with. The first one is E again, or E would block, uh, which means that the sending could not happen and we need to retry later. In that case, the engine enters cannot send mode. Uh, to exit this mode, the user should call the LSQuick engine send and set packets when sending is possible again. Uh, engine also implements a fallback mechanism. It's going to try sending packets again one second later regardless. Uh, this is because we don't expect inability to send to last over one second. Uh, the second error code is uh, e-message size, and it means that the packet was too large. Uh, this occurs when LSQuick sends MTU probes. In that case, engine is going to retry sending again right away, but without the packet that's too large. All other errors cause immediate connection termination because LSQuick does not know what to do about those errors. Outgoing packet specification. This is what it looks like, struct LS quick out spec. Uh, in addition to the packet payload, the specification contains uh, local and destination addresses, which is the reverse of the addresses passed to the packets in function, and contains the peer context, which in a tutorial program is simply the file descriptor, and the ECN. Uh, the reason for using IAVEC is uh, that UDP diagram may contain several quick packets. The way it works is that during quick handshake, uh, packets with long headers uh, can be put together into the uh, UDP diagram or coalesced in quick lingo. And this is done in order to minimize the number of packets or the UDP diagrams that need to be sent. LSQuick takes advantage of this, uh, of this protocol and tries to coalesce as many packets as it can. And here's a made up packets out example. You can see that send message is uh, called in a loop for each specification. Uh, you can also see that peer context is cast to an integer because it's just a file descriptor. And you will also notice that we ignore the value of ECN and local address in the packet specification. This example is similar to the first version of the packets out function in tutorial.c. A more involved packet out function is available and it will use ancillary messages to specify local address and the ECN. Uh, to choose a different packet out function, use the dash P1 option on the command line. The simple version is the default, dash P0, and the or more involved packets out version is the dash P1. Now, 
now that we covered uh, how to initialize the library, instantiate the engines and uh, send and receive packets, we'll talk about processing connections. LSQuick has the concept of tick, which is a way to describe what a connection does when it does something productive. Uh, other verbs we could have settled in would be like kick, prod, or poke, but we settled on tick because it's a little bit more dignified. Now there's a single function that can tell the user whether and when there are connections that need to be processed. Uh, and this function is LSQuick engine earliest adv tick, where adv stands for advisory. And now advisory means that you don't have to call this function, the process connections at that particular point in time. It is just the best to do so. If there are connections to be processed, this function returns a true value and sets diff to number of microseconds uh, from current time when this uh, processing should take place. Note that diff could be negative, in which case it means that uh, the perfect time for processing connection has passed. The engine keeps all connections in several data structures and it tracks each connection's timers and it knows when to fire them. That's how I can tell you when to fire, when to process uh, connections. And here's the example with the event loop uh, from our tutorial program. You can see that we first stop the timer. Uh, we call LSQuick engine process cons. And when this function is called, that's when engine will call all the callbacks that it needs. After the connections have been processed, uh, we call uh, LSQuick engine earliest add tick function to find out whether their connections to be processed and when. And if it turns true, then we specify calculate the value of a new timeout and restart the timer and start the process of the um, loop again. Now, sometimes this function LSQuick engine earliest add tick may return the false value, even if there are connections managed by the engine. And this happens when the connection has idle timer turned off, meaning there are no events to be fired at all. But that doesn't happen in the standard setup. Tickable connection. Uh, there are several ways for a connection to do something productive. When a connection can do any of the following things, it is tickable. Uh, there are incoming packets. A user wants to uh, read from stream and there is data to be read. A user wants to write to stream and stream is writable, or user has uh, written to stream outside of callbacks, that's allowed, and now there's some buffered packets that need to be scheduled and sent out, or uh, LSQuick needs to do something internally, uh, such as uh, send out a control frame, or perhaps services stream, such as call a on close um, function on a stream. Processing connections. Uh, so connect all connections are processed using this single function, LSQuick engine process cons. And this call, uh, inside this call, all the necessary callbacks are called to send out packets and uh, on new, on uh, read and read, all the read and write events. Um, this function is not re-entrant, so do not call it from other callbacks. Uh, you should call this function when advised by the LSQuick engine earliest add tick. Uh, but note that event loop is really not necessary. And as a matter of fact, the library will still work if you simply call LSQuick engine process cons in a loop every 10 milliseconds, but that's not recommended. Another function that sends packets is uh, LSQuick engine sent and sent packets. Uh, and that should be called when there was an earlier failure to send packets as we've discussed before with the E again error code. Engine callbacks. Uh, let us continue initializing the engine instance. We have covered the callbacks to send out packets. This is one of the required engine callbacks. The other set of required engine callbacks are connection and stream callbacks, such as on new connection, on read, and so on. And for the server, there's a callback to get default TLS context. Uh, now, I also would like to mention some optional callbacks, which will not be covered in this presentation, but they're good to be aware of in the future. Uh, there are callbacks to look up certificate by SNI, uh, which is necessary when you when your application protocol demands it, such as HTTP3. Uh, there are callbacks to control memory allocation for outgoing packets. This is useful when you use um, an alternative network stack, and for example, all of your outgoing packets must be contained in contiguous memory. Uh, for multi-process setup, there are callbacks to 
observed connection ID lifecycle when connections are created and destroyed, as well as a shared memory hash, which allows multiple processes to share uh, crypto information. Uh, there's also an optional set of HTTP header calls to process incoming HTTP headers. Now we will talk about streaming connection callbacks. Uh, streaming connection callbacks are the way that the library communicates with the user code. Some of these callbacks are mandatory and others are optional. The mandatory callbacks are destruction and creation of connections in stream and uh, stream read and write events. Optional callbacks are, have to, usually have to do with the connection lifecycle and they involve things such as receiving a go away from peer or ha having a new um, TLS uh, session ticket. Let us go through this connection, through these uh, callbacks one by one. When a connection object is created, the on new connection callback is called. In server mode, the handshake is already known to have succeeded. In client mode, the connection object is created before the handshake is successful. The client can tell whether or not the handshake succeeds by using the optional on handshake done callback or just by watching the on connection close callback. In the made up example on the slide, we can see that we allocate per connection context and then we return this pointer to this new context. This is the connection context that will be associated with this connection for its duration. Uh, note that it's perfectly okay to return null. You don't have to create a connection context. Also in, in this callback, if you're a client and want to send some requests, which you probably do, this is a good place to call LSQuick can make stream and after handshake succeeds, LSQuick will call on a stream new callback when your stream is created. On new stream. Now, Quick allows either endpoint to create streams and send and receive data on them. There are unidirectional and bidirectional streams and that's the total of four stream types. Uh, but in our simple example, we stick to the usual paradigm of a single stream per request. The client sends the request and server sends the response back on the same bidirectional stream. Uh, on the server, the stream is created when the new requests arrive and on the client are created when client calls the function we discussed earlier, LSQuick can make stream. Now on this slide, you can see that uh, similar to previous slide on connection new, uh, you can create a per stream context and associate with the stream by returning it. Uh, this is the stream context which will be associated with the stream for the duration of its lifetime. And just as before it's okay to return null, you're not forced to create a uh, context for the stream. And if you're a client, and this is the um, request, the stream that you want to write a request on, here you would like to indicate that you want to write to this stream by using LSQ extreme won't write and passing it a true value. This will cause uh, the LSQ to call the on write event when appropriate, when the stream becomes writable. If you're the server, then you'll probably want to call LSQ extreme won't read and that will call the stream on read event when stream becomes readable. And here is the on read call. Uh, the, inside this callback, you will be able to read from stream or to collect an error. To read the data or collect the error, you should call the same function, lsqx stream read, and it returns a signed size type. And uh, if it's a negative value, it means an error has occurred. Uh, the usual error is the e would block, which means that you can't read from stream yet. This occurs if you read a couple of times from stream or just read in a loop. Mm. But if there's a different error, such as a protocol error or library error, the connection is going to be aborted. And here you can see that uh, zero means that you've reached the end of stream when reading. Uh, the on write event looks like this. Uh, it is called when stream can be written to. At this point, you should be able to write at least one byte to the stream. As with the on read callback, uh, for this callback to be called, the user must have registered interest in writing by calling lsquickstream won't write function. And here we can see that after we are done writing all the data we wanted, 
we can call LS Quick Stream Close, which will close both reading and writing side of the stream, and that will cause the on close connection to be called. Uh, when reading and writing ends, on close callback is called. After this function returns, the stream pointer becomes invalid. Don't reference it afterwards. Uh, the library will delete it in an appropriate, appropriate time. Uh, here's a good time to clean up your press stream connection. Here we can see that we call free at the end of this callback. And also just for example, if there's no more uh, connections, a request to send, we can call lsquickcon close to close the connection. Now when lsquickcon close is called or the peer sends the connection close frame or an error occurs, uh, the on connection close stream is called. Uh, oh, now is the example of a stream on close event in the tutorial program. This is the server part. You can see that we uh, cast the second argument to our stream context and we free it. And then we log a message. Uh, pretty simple. And here is the uh, on connection close. Um, you can see that similar to on stream close, we uh, free the context. And if uh, we're closing the connection, we exit the event loop, for example. Also, after this function returns, the connection pointer becomes invalid. The library will destroy it. Do not reference it again. Here is the example from uh, the tutorial program. The per connection context is simply pointed to the tutorial struct, so we don't need to free it. On the other hand, uh, we do stop the event loop. Uh, that's because our tutorial program is a very simple client. It makes a single connection and when connection exits, there is no reason to continue. Um, more about streams. To reduce buffering, bytes written to stream are written to package directly, except when they aren't. Uh, what LSQuick does is uh, tries to create full packets, otherwise it buffers uh, these bytes in the stream. Uh, there's a function LSQuick uh, stream flush that flushes the bytes out. It is impossible to write more data than the congestion window. This prevents excessive buffering inside the library. Inside the on read and on write callbacks, reading and writing should succeed. The exception is error collection, uh, which happens inside the on read callback. Uh, by default, on read and on write callbacks are going to be called in a loop. So if you're done reading from or writing to stream, you should either shut down the appropriate end, close the stream, or unregister your interest from reading and writing by uh, calling won't read or won't write function with a false argument. Otherwise, you'll enter an infinite loop. Uh, now, by default, LSQuick implements a circuit breaker by watching progress, whether or not the callback is making progress reading to reading from or writing to stream, and it will break you out. Uh, this particular feature saved my uh, butt a couple of times. Now, um, outside of the callbacks, be ready to handle errors. Uh, you don't have to read from stream or write to stream inside the callback. You can do it outside the callback. It is not recommended, but you can do it. Uh, then you have to be able to handle uh, return values of minus one from read function or return values of zero from write function when you could not write to stream. And here are some more useful stream functions. As mentioned before, LSQuick stream flash will cause the stream to packetize the buffered data. Uh, note that it may not happen immediately because there might not be enough congestion window to, um, to do so. What happens instead is that uh, the stream schedules a flush of buffers to particular offset, and it does it when possible. Uh, shutdown and close are modeled on the regular shutdown and close um, functions in Unix and they take the same arguments. Now, after both ends of the stream are closed, the on stream close will be called. Now, stream return values. Now, read and write are modeled on uh, the standard reading and write, including the use of error known. The two most important error codes are e would block and e can reset because you may encounter them during regular programming, even if you do everything correctly. 
The first one, E would block, means that you could not read from stream and you should try again. E can reset means that the stream was reset and that's sort of an application um, thing. Other errors uh, should not happen. And usually when there's a protocol error or library error, your connection will be aborted. Note that return values of zero are different for reads and write. For read, it means that you have read uh, the end of stream marker and you should stop reading. For writes, it means that you can write no more. Uh, when writing to a stream returns an error, it may mean that a memory allocation failed, in which case you should be able to retry later. Or it may it will probably mean a protocol error or an application or a library error. In that case, your connection will be aborted. You should not encounter a return value of minus one during regular programming when calling write. Uh, more ways to read and write. Um, there's the scatter gather form of reading and writing, and it is modeled on the standard read v and write v functions. Uh, all return values and error codes are the same as for the read and write functions we covered before, uh, which makes sense because those functions are simply wrappers around the scatter gather versions. Read using a callback. What's interesting is that the scatter gather functions themselves are wrappers around functions that implement reading and writing using a function. Uh, read f and write f functions that use a callback. Uh, so one of those functions is lsquick stream read f, and it is passed the callback to process incoming data directly. Uh, the callback returns number of bytes processed and is passed a pointer to user supplied object, which is the third argument to read f function, as well as the data. Uh, which can be zero length, and the fin marker, which indicates that after this len bytes, uh, end of stream marker is coming. Now, this callback is called in a loop until it returns zero or until it returns a value that is smaller than len, which indicates a short read, and then the stream will stop calling this callback. Stream read copy data. So here is the example of reading from the tutorial. You can see it's v0 because this is the default version. Uh, the client possesses three different on read uh, callbacks and you can select which one to use by using the dash b command line flag. Dash b0 is the default. Um, so here the three byte buffer is here just for illustration purposes, just to illustrate that this callback is indeed called in a loop. This is a pretty simple way to read. Stream read take two, using a callback. And here's the second version of the client's on stream read uh, callback. On the command line, use the dash b1. Here we use the lsquick stream read f function, and this example is split into two sides, two parts. Uh, because we don't, because we just uh, print the data to standard out, we don't need to pass any extra user data to the callback and we just pass null. And if zero is returned, it means that we hit the end of stream. And here's the callback itself for the second version of the on read uh, callback. Uh, so here you can see that we just uh, write the data if there is any to be had to standard out and return the length. Note that the data size length can be anything. Uh, this size is not limited by the maximum diagram size uh, because if LSQuick detects a stream fragmentation attack, or when in, in short, if there is excessive fragmentation in incoming stream frames, it switches to a more robust data structure for incoming data and starts copying into the data structure. So you may be given a much larger chunk of data to process. Uh, so don't rely on length to be any particular value. Uh, and to stop reading using this callback, as I mentioned before, you can just uh, return zero or uh, return a value smaller than len, or you can make LS quick, uh, no, pardon, this is uh, gonna be the next slide. And here's the third version. Uh, you may have noticed that in previous version, we didn't do anything with the fin indicator. 
and here we're going to use it to stop reading as soon as we hit uh, thin. This is a little bit more uh, efficient because we save on this uh, on one on read call. Um, so here we package pointers to the tutorials uh, struct and the stream into a special v2 ctx struct and we pass the pointer to it to read f and the callback is on the next slide and here's the callback used for the third version of on read callback you can see now it is more complicated because we've moved the logic to shut down the reading side of the stream and to restart the event loop into this function as before we write data to standard out but if we hit the fin then uh, we're going to call stream shutdown and restart reading from standard input. Just to make things interesting, uh, it is the server that possesses different ways to write from stream. And there are two ways. Here's the first one. This is the default. On the server command line, you can uh, select W0 to use the default or W1 to use the second version. This is the default. It calls LSQX stream write. And if it returns a positive number, then we advance the pointer. And we, if, we, if we have written as much as we intended to, then we can just close the stream. Um, so this is uh, simple. And here, to use the second version, we're going to use the LSQX stream write F function it is a little bit more involved because instead of just passing a single callback we pass a pointer to a struct that contains two callbacks one is to read data or to copy data to the packet and the second callback it is the size callback which tells you how many bytes you have left this is useful when the data source you're reading from may change in size such as when reading from the file descriptor And here is the second version of on-write callback for the server. You can see that the reader is initialized uh, with um, the read and size function pointers. We're going to cover them in the following slides. And the TCC, TSCC uh, struct. And we call write f, we examine the return value of um, this writer function and we call the stream if we're done writing. Uh, here's the size callback. Uh, now the size is pretty simple. It just returns number of size left. And here's the reader read callback. Now read callback is called read callback because you read from data source and write to the packet. Uh, now here you pass the count and you're supposed to copy no more than count bytes to buffer and uh, return number of bytes written. Uh, now count is calculated using uh, the size callback and note that even though in our example, this value count is never larger than the number of bytes left uh, in a different situation when you were reading from file descriptor and the file could be truncated, you could actually pass the number larger than how many bytes you have left, in which case you have to check something to be aware of. Uh, client, making the connection. Uh, are there any questions about the stuff I've covered so far? It doesn't seem like there are questions, so I'm going to continue. Uh, we now switch our attention to making a quick connection from the client. Uh, the functional quick engine connect does that. It has 12 arguments. These arguments have accreted over the years. Uh, we're going to cover them one by one on this slide. And on the next slide, we're going to look at the example from the tutorial program. So the first argument is the uh, pointer to the engine. The second argument is the version, which is needs to be used to the version of the connection you prefer. Uh, the second two arguments are pointers to local and peer socket addresses. Next argument is the peer context. Uh, the sixth argument is the connection context. Now this uh, connection context pointer is useful if you want to pass a value 
to the on connection, to the on new connection callback. Now, note that this is a connection context, so it's going to be overwritten by the return value of that callback. Uh, the seventh argument is hostname, and in Quick, in ITF Quick, it is used for SNI. Uh, next argument is the maximum UDP datagram size, and it's going to be used as the base PLPMTU if uh, DPLPMTU D support is enabled in LS Quick, and it is enabled by default. Uh, the next two arguments uh, point to resumption information, which allow you to resume session, and in ITF Quick, it's usually just a pointer to the TLS uh, session ticket. And the last two arguments are uh, pointer to a token. And uh, these are the token will allow you to bypass potentially a server side uh, stateless retry. Uh, now, session resume information and the token can be gotten from a previous connection using the optional callbacks. One is called on session resume information, and the other one is called on new token. If this uh, callbacks are not specified, you get uh, you don't get this information. Now let's look at the example. Ah, pardon, before the example, let's talk about uh, quick versions. Uh, quick versions and LS Quick are gathered in an enum LS Quick version. Uh, the actual value of this enum is not important. The special value nlsqver specifies to LS Quick engine connect to pick a default version. And by default, LS Quick will pick the, the highest non-experimental version. Uh, non-experimental from the point of view of LS Quick. So for example, it supports the Internet Draft 29 very well, even though Internet 29 is experimental in the eyes of uh, IETF. Um, now, because version unum values are small, and that's by design, uh, lists of versions can be packed into a bit mask and passed around like that. And in, in a few places in the LS Quick API, it is done. Uh, one prominent place is the settings member ES versions, which is just a bit mask of supported versions. And by default, LS Quick uh, engine will support all the versions. And here's the connect call from the tutorial program to that. See, you can see that it is a lot less intimidating than before because uh, half the arguments are set to zero. Uh, so first we see the pointer to the engine and the LSQ, uh, LSQ ver special value. Uh, we, we pass two uh, socket addresses and we cast our file descriptor to a pointer and the rest is zero and off you go. Now the peer contact, the, the socket file descriptor is what will get passed to the sent packets out. This is the peer context. Server, additional callbacks. Now the server requires an SSL context to be SSL callbacks to be present. The basic callback is the uh, get SSL CTX because it is used to create TLS connections. Uh, in case SNI is used, LS Quick will use EA lookup cert callback. Uh, for example, in our web server, each virtual host has its own uh, SSL context, and this function allows one to look up the necessary virtual host by SNI. Uh, notice that the uh, lookup function besides the SNI also provides a pointer to the local address, and this makes for a nice flexible lookup function. Engine settings. Beside the engine API passed to the um, engine constructor, there's also an engine settings struct, LS Quick engine settings. Uh, the EA settings member of the um, LS, the, the engine API can be pointed to these settings, which is settings are null by default. Now, there are many settings controlling everything from flow, con flow control windows to the number of times an on-read uh, callback is called in a loop before a circuit breaker is kicking in. Uh, to make uh, changing default settings easier, because there are over 50 settings, uh, there are two auxiliary functions provided, one to initialize the settings struct and one to check it for errors. And here are the setting helper functions. The first function is LS Quick Engine in its settings, which does just that. Uh, the first argument is the uh, LS Quick Engine setting struct, and the second argument is the 
server and HTTP flag bit mask. This bit mask uh, must be the same as the one passed to the engine constructor uh, because the settings that depend on the value of both the server bit and the HTTP bit. Uh, the second uh, function, LS Quick Engine check settings, uh, takes the first two arguments which are the same as the initialization function and the two the third and fourth arguments are pointed to the error buffer in case there is an error the human readable error can be placed in this error buffer and then uh, printed or logged uh, this uh, these arguments are optional now note that the check settings function only checks for basic errors uh, there are many ways to misconfigure lsq so please test Settings example in tutorial, let's see, part one of two. So here we see the, um, this is a part of the wild get opt loop in the main uh, function. We can see that we use the dash O option to specify options or settings. And the dash O is followed by a name value pair separated by the equal sign. Uh, the first time we see the dash O, we initialize the settings. And you can see that we figure out whether or not we are client or a server based on the values of cert file and key file pointers, which means that dash C and dash K must precede dash O on the command line. After initialization, uh, we parse apt arg. And in this case, we change the value of uh, congestion control algorithm to the one specified on the command line. Uh, so for example, cubic is one and BBR is two and default is uh, zero. Settings example in Turtle that C part two. Uh, so after uh, we're done processing options, uh, we call the check engine settings. And here you can see how the error buffer is used. If there is an error, then we print it and exit with a failure. And at the very end of everything is checking out correctly, but before the engine constructor is called, we assign the pointer to the settings struct uh, with the EA settings in the engine API struct. Logging mechanism. Uh, LSQ provides a simple logging interface uh, with just a single callback function. By default, no messages are logged. They're all thrown away. Uh, this can be changed by calling LSQ logger init function and providing the logger function. Uh, the library can generate timestamps and include them along with the error messages. And this timestamps style is enumerated in the enum. You can see at the bottom of the slides. Uh, you can see by the name of enums, what type of timestamps there are, whether or not they include the microseconds, milliseconds, or dates. One of the most use, useful uh, timestamps styles is Chrome-like uh, because when you develop with Chrome and enable debug messages, it has its own timestamp, which is very strange. Uh, but it is uh, uh, useful to compare output of your endpoint and Chrome side by side. And in this case, you can use timestamp that look exactly the same and log the same time. Logging levels and modules. There are eight log levels in LS Quick, uh, and this is correspond to the usual log levels, and those, for example, in syslog. Uh, but uh, LSQuick uses only the first five, uh, debug info, notice, warning, and error. Usually warning and error messages uh, are printed only when there's a bug in the library or some protocol error occurs or memory initialization or memory allocation failure. Uh, other errors are not logged because it's not really LSQuick's job. Now LSQuick also contains many log modules, uh, over 40 by last count. Uh, each module corresponds to a particular set of functionality or a component in the LS Quick library, such as engine, uh, BBR, stream connection, handshake, and so on. One exception is the event module, which is a cross, uh, cross module, uh, module and prints interesting events in all the modules. So now there are two functions to change log levels and modules. Uh, the first one is LS Quick set log level and it changes log levels for all the modules. Uh, the default log level is warning. And the second uh, function is LSQIC logger LOPT, which can set a particular, which can set log levels for a particular module. Logging in tutorial part one out of two. So uh, by default, log, me log uh, messages in the tutorial program go to standard error. 
uh, you can change it by using the dash F option and the dash L and dash capital L specify the log levels. And here is the um, log function itself. We can see that we simply write it to the file handle, flush it and return zero. Uh, one interesting note here is that even though this function is an int function, it turns zero on success, this value is ignored by us quick uh, because it doesn't know what to do about the log function that fails. I mean, the only thing it could do is call this log function again for it to fail again. Uh, and at the bottom of the slide, you can see how we pass um, this uh, pointer to struct to the library and how we specify uh, how we specify the type of uh, timestamp that to be generated. Uh, logging into that C part two out of two. And here we are inside the wild get opt loop again. We can see how the lowercase l invokes the logger l opt function and uppercase l invokes the ls quick set log level. Both of these functions uh, may fail because you may have misspelled the log level or module name. And here's a log messaging uh, example. This is uh, taken from a client. I had to break up lines and I had to uh, elide the uh, timestamp on the left. Uh, but here you can definitely immediately see that uh, there is a quick connection uh, logged on the left. And in some of these error mess in those log messages, you can see that the connection is followed by a dash and a number. In this case, it's dash zero, and zero corresponds to stream number. So in this case, we're dealing with stream number zero, which is the first request. Uh, the first one, event module, says that we generate a stream frame on stream zero with offset zero and size three, and uh, there's a fin bit set in this frame. Um, I just tapped in high on the command line and I hit enter and it sent it to the server. Uh, then we see that the stream flushed past required offset three and we sent a packet. So this log message is logged after send message is called. It was packet number 13. Uh, the type is short. It is forward secure. 32 bytes long contains uh, frames of only one type stream. The ECN value is zero. Spin bit is zero. Key phase is zero. Path is zero. And there are some internal flags that uh, are not important right now. Uh, some time later, uh, we can see that we get a response packet back of size 44 and uh, receive history, which is a separate uh, component. And here you can see the module richest is received packet number 15. Uh, we parse the ACK frame, which acts uh, packets nine through 13. And uh, you can see that our packet um, 13 we sent before is ACT. Uh, we're about to process a uh, frame stream, a uh, stream frame. And, you know, it also is on stream zero with offset zero and size three. So it's just our reverse high string back. And that very last uh, message that's chopped a little bit at the end says DI, this is the data in module, um, which I mentioned before, uh, LS Quick has several of them to be able to switch to uh, a robust incoming data module to prevent, to mitigate uh, uh, stream fragmentation attacks. So logging is very useful, uh, but another useful tool is Wireshark. Wireshark supports ITF quick and the Wireshark developers have been very good with following the latest uh, ITF uh, drafts. You'll need version 3.3 for the internet draft 29 support. Uh, now LS quick supports exporting TLS secrets using its key log interface. And here on the slide, you can see how we initialize the engine API struct by passing it um, pointer to a struct with function pointers we're going to describe on the next slide. And uh, oh, then the dash G option specifies the directory in which the secret file will be created. Now the secret file can then be loaded by Wireshark and your quick connection will be decrypted. And uh, here is LS Kick API for key logging. There are three functions, one to open the file, one to log a line, and one to close the handle. And here we see how it's specified in the LS Quick Engine API. And uh, here how it looks in the tutorial program. We will not cover every function. We will just note uh, how the struct is initialized. 
and we don't interpret the secret line, we just print it to the file and we flush the handle. So after we jump through all those hoops, our reward is a decrypted uh, quick connection in Wireshark. You can see on the bottom panel, I've highlighted the reverse hello that we received from stream. Um, oh, this is not the same session as the one that we looked uh, when we looked at the log messages. Uh, in, the, in the middle panel, you can see that besides the stream frame, we have a uh, timestamp and act frames. Uh, and on the top panel, you can see that next to the packet numbers and connection IDs, um, Wireshark helpfully prints lists of uh, frame types contained in a packet. Another interesting thing to note in this display in the top panel is that even though there are one connection, the connection IDs are different. And we'll talk about it next. Now, each quick connection has two sets of connection IDs. One set is the source connection IDs, or SSIDs, and the other set are, is destination connection IDs, or DSIDs. Now, source connection IDs is what the peer uses to uh, put into its packet when it sends the packets to us. And destination connection IDs are what we use to put into a packet to send to our peer. Now, one endpoint's destination connection IDs are other endpoint's source connection IDs and vice versa. Uh, what's interesting about these connection IDs is that each endpoint can choose to change the destination connection ID it uses at any time for any reason. So if you see a uh, uh, log, uh, log file with connection IDs that are different, it doesn't mean that it's different, those are different connections. It may be just the same connection. Uh, now, on this slide, you can see how LS Quick represents a connection. Uh, connection IDs can be up to 20 bytes in length. Uh, by default, uh, I say by default because, of course, you can configure this option in LS Quick. Uh, by default, LS Quick uses 8-byte long connection IDs to speed up comparison. And you can see how comparisons performed by looking at the um, macro at the bottom of this slide. Get this and that APIs. Um, now here's some miscellaneous functions to get uh, to objects from other objects in LS Quick. Uh, now the seed returned by the first function, LS Quick can ID is different depending on the client, uh, whether or not your client or server. The server returns the current source connection ID and the client returns the current destination connection ID. The end result is when you're debugging your implementation and you look at the two log files from client and server, the connection ID is going to match. Uh, as I said, as I just said before, do not rely on the connection ID to be unique for a connection. Use some other means to identify your connection in your code. LS Quick stream can gets you a connection pointer from a stream. LS Quick can get engine gets the engine from a connection, and LS Quick can get sac adder uh, points your local and peer pointers to the uh, current paths, uh, local and peer addresses. Now, Quick doesn't do a true multipath yet, but LS Quick supports uh, several path objects internally for during path migration. So, when uh, there is multipath support in Quick, perhaps in version two or version three, this API will change and they'll be able to get addresses for any path and perhaps do things that are a little bit more complicated. Stream priorities. Uh, LS Quick inherited stream priorities from Google Quick. Uh, now ITF Quick streams do not have priorities. Priority information in ITF Quick is supposed to be communicated by a communication protocol, such as for example, HTTP three, um, and HTTP3 priorities are not yet uh, even a draft that can be used. Uh, however, it does mean we couldn't use priorities now. Uh, priorities numbered 1 through 56, where the lower number is high priority. Uh, the stream priority controls uh, the order in which on-write and on-read callbacks are called, and the packetization priority for stream data. And now we've reached the last slide. Uh, we have covered only the basic functionality of LS Quick. 
it supports many more things. Um, please refer to online documentation at lsquigreadthedogs.io. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be very glad to answer them now. Uh, the question is, uh, do I have any performance comparison with other quick implementations? Uh, we have done a couple of them. Uh, they're available at our blog. I don't have it handy here, but if you go to blog.lightspeedtech.com, uh, you'll be able to find them. Uh, because of our name, Lightspeed, uh, we aim to be the fastest, and we believe we are the fastest. But of course, we always welcome people to run their own benchmarks. And as a matter of fact, we made our benchmarking mechanism available on GitHub so you can try to reproduce our benchmarks. Um, I have a question. Um, how tightly coupled is Quick to the underlying UDP uh, transport? Uh, theoretically, it's not uh, tightly coupled, but uh, recently I was looking at it and it is indeed very tightly coupled to UDP. Uh, there are mentions of PTM, uh, P DPL, PMTUD in the quick transport draft itself. And there's uh, things like tuples mentioned in the draft. So yes, it's coupled to UDP and in, in IP. I think uh, uh, IETF quick charter uh, talks specifically about UDP. Okay. So um, I'm trying to think, like, could you implement this over RDMA, do you think? I don't know what that is, but I think yes. Okay. I mean, there's nothing really besides uh, this, you know, well, you saw the, um, in our API, you saw the socket addresses. I mean, if you replace them with something else, uh, then it will just work. Uh, I prepared some backup slides. I believe I have a few minutes. Uh, if you guys have more questions on LS Quick proper, you can ask them uh, while I talk about some of the other things I prepared. Does it sound good? I have one question. Uh, All right. Is it hard to extract the secret keys from LS Quick, for example, for hardware offloading of the flows? It should not be. Uh, because, uh, you know, we use Boring SSL and Boring SSL provides the API for that. Okay. Uh, we uh, do some handshake offloading in our uh, enterprise version of our web server, uh, but LS Quick library itself does not provide it. Okay. But yeah, it could, it, it could be done. All right, during the um, proposal of this talk, uh, one thing that I was asked is whether or not uh, LS Quick uh, or the Quick community had any wish list for Linux kernel. And the first bonus section is Linux wish list. And indeed, we have wishes. Uh, the biggest wish, of course, is that the UDP processing and the Linux kernel were just a little bit more, a little, just a little bit faster. But that's an obvious wish. And there are a couple of non obvious things that uh, you may find interesting. The first one is that there is no way to use ECN and GSO at the same time. Uh, ECN is recommended by uh, the IETF transport draft and LS Quick supports it and GSO can be used to speed up sending of UDP packets, uh, but there's no way to do both at the same time. Um, so it would be nice to have. Um, the second wish or the second problem rather I've run into very recently is when I was implementing uh, DPL PMTUD. Now the uh, PL in DPL PMTUD stands for packet layer, uh, which means that LSQ's job to create MTU probes and uh, run the protocol itself. Uh, but I found that there is no way to make send message not fail when the datagram is too large for the local interface. It always returns minus one with the E message size. Uh, now, from the perspective of DPL PMTUD, it would be much nicer if we just let it drop silently on the floor, but there is no option to do that. Uh, so what dealing with this error made me do is first introduce a couple of branches in a loop, which I like to stay fast. Uh, and second, it is just more complicated dealing with a retry. So now I have to, in that send out packets batch uh, that we talked about before, now I have to figure out where it stopped skip this packet, do something with it actually, and then retry the uh, second part of the batch immediately. 
Uh, and that complication or that complexity actually added a couple of regressions, uh, which thankfully we caught during testing time before deploying it. Um, but yeah, this would be nice to be able to specify maybe a fourth value for the uh, IPMT discover uh, socket option. Well, if there are comments to this, I have a second bonus section. Uh, I've talked a lot about HTTP3 today without talking more about it, and now is the time for me to do so. Now, HTTP3 is a quick skiller feature, and uh, my opinion is that success or failure of HTTP3 will dictate success or failure of the quick protocol itself. Now, how to do HTTP3? Um, HTTP3 is similar to HTTP2 over quick. Uh, the protocol is similar, but they're not the same, and it is not a simple protocol. Uh, HTTP3 has sub-protocols, uh, such as header compression and uh, the upcoming priorities. It has control streams and it has data framing. Uh, thankfully, as I mentioned before, LSP hides most of that stuff from the user. Uh, so the user only needs to be aware what new knobs to turn and new functions to use. And on this slide, we'll discuss the HTTP3 differences as far as LSP usage is concerned. Uh, now, SNI is required. Uh, for our purposes, it just means that the client needs to specify the seventh argument to the connect function, which will become the SNI indicator, and the server must use the EA lookup cert callback. Uh, HTTP headers need to be sent before the body of HTTP message. There's a special function for that, LSQ extreme send headers. And there's also an optional callback uh, to process the response HTTP headers. If this callback is not specified, then LSQ will pretend this is a HTTP one stream. It will translate those uh, headers into a stream and you can just pretend you parsing HTTP one stream. Uh, I mean, it works, but it's not efficient. You, you, you're better off using, the, um, using these uh, callbacks. And as a bonus in the tutorial program, there's also an HA3 CLI program, which is a simple HTTP three client. Uh, to run it, give it a host name and the port number and the path, and hit lightspeedtech.com. A couple of other websites to try is google.com and facebook.com. Uh, you can change the default method by using the dash capital M option. The default method is get. Um, and now we're going to look inside a little bit. Now we saw this in the previous slides, LS engine HTTP flag, and you need to pass it to three functions. Init settings, check settings, and the engine constructor. Without this flag, the engine constructor is not going to do the HTTP magic. And uh, this is how you would connect. Uh, this is, looks exactly like the previous connect call. The only difference now we set the host name and this becomes the SNI in the Quicks client hello. And uh, this is the on-write um, callback in HTTP3 simple client. You can see here in the bottom that we send HTTP headers, then we close the right end and prepare for reading. If our simple client supported methods such as put, put, uh, post or put methods with HTTP payloads, we would not stop writing. We would continue writing using the regular stream write uh, function. Here, however, we've just prepared to read the response from the server. Uh, Another thing to note here is that we package, we use a special helper function to package these uh, headers into the LS XPAC header array. Otherwise, it just not fit on a slide. And this is how you do HTTP3 in using LS Quick. Now you can just read the uh, results from the server. And if you have it running, you should see it working, hopefully. Um, and now it's here the last slide. Uh, now HTTP3 is its own protocol. And of course it has its own configuration parameters. And of course LS Quick supports all of those configuration parameters. Uh, some of the most interesting ones have to do with compression, QPAC. Uh, there are choices such as table size and ability to risk or not risk uh, a number of streams. And uh, changing these parameters uh, will affect your performance. So uh, feed them uh, to suit your needs. Uh, 
Uh, and I was watching the TLS presentations earlier and was salivating. And then I remembered that Quick can take advantage of any of them, <laughs> of any of the nice uh, kernel or hardware uh, speed ups, at least not easily. Looks like we have no more questions. Do you have some more bonus uh, sections for us? No, that's it. I've run out. Uh, I, I was, uh, you know, uh, doing this too. I, I didn't want to make it too much. Uh, I mean, I could go deeper into HTTP3, but I don't know. You're probably all tired by looking at code and looking at the APIs. I know that fitting all of this in just over an hour is pretty tough to follow. But uh, hopefully uh, you guys got a feel for uh, how to use LS quick. Thank you much. Thank you.